All right, looks like our numbers are stabilizing, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, in Intro to Ballerina. I'm Caitlin Barnard, Marketing Manager at CNCF, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, as well as today's presenter, Paul Fremantle, CTO and co-founder of WSO2. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee. So there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to drop any of your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. The session is also being recorded and will be sent out afterwards along with the slide, the slides and link to the presentation. So with that, I'll hand it over to Paul to kick off today's presentation. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to uh, join us for this webinar. So uh, the, the presentation is actually mainly going to be a live demo. Um, hopefully that will all work. But before I jump into that, I just want to spend about three minutes just explaining why we built a language, which is obviously a, a question a lot of people ask. Um, so uh, I think that's, that's kind of important to sort of help you understand that the motivations and, and the purpose of this language. And um, so let's just sort of start by looking at uh, the, the overall industry, especially around the software. And, and what we see is that there's this massive disaggregation of systems. And, and this is really driven by customer demand. Customer demand for bigger scale services, you know, Google, Netflix, Amazon, Alibaba and also uh, customer demand for agility, for people to move quicker to create new capabilities faster. And that agility and scale both drive these smaller and smaller components that can be reused. And we've seen this shift happen over five, six decades. So this, this is not a flash in the pan. This is an ongoing and in inevitable shift and, and these components are all becoming network accessible whether they're serverless functions apis microservices uh, data as a service SaaS apps everything is becoming a programmable endpoint and so increasingly when we build, build applications we are not just building systems that live on their own but we're building systems that have to integrate and talk to network programmable endpoints uh, and every every developer i know is is creating systems that are talking to other network apis and endpoints and so as we do that you know there are challenges distributed computing is not the same as local computing and, and typically historically we called this art of writing distributed applications we call it integration and there are challenges to integration there are distributed transactions there are patterns like circuit breakers there's protocol handling there's security there's error handling all of these challenges make writing distributed computing systems harder than locally based computing systems and that art and science of creating distributed computing systems has typically been done in one of two ways. So uh, my background is I've worked on a whole bunch of integration products. I, I've built early ESBs uh, in open source uh, and at various companies. Uh, I've worked on business process management. I've worked with enterprise application hubs. These integration products inherently understand the challenges of distributed computing and have things like circuit breakers, load balancers, failover, compensation, all those kind of things, payload handling built in. But they have a big problem, which is that they, they don't fit neatly and nicely into a developer-focused, agile, iterative development process. They don't fit into that you know, code, build, run, test cycle that, that we go through as developers. So the other approach is to take a general purpose programming language and then try and then build distributed systems and when you do that you you have you have a choice you either write the code yourself to handle those those error cases those distributed systems or you import a framework and and when you do that you take responsibility for solving those integration challenges and so we believe that 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 those 
general purpose languages are, are perhaps not as integration simple as they could be, and the integration products are not as agile as they could be. And so we, we call this the integration gap, that there's a, there's a sort of a space there. And, and we decided that perhaps one way of solving that was to create a language that inherently tried to address integration, distributed computing and network computing concepts in the language, but it's a full language that fits well into an agile development process. And that's Ballerina. And um, uh, the easiest way to explain it is to, is to just show you some code. So I'm going to just jump in and start coding. Uh, it's a compiled type safe concurrent programming language. So it doesn't use, um, it's not, it's not a, it's not a dynamic language, it, but it ha it looks similar to dynamic languages. It's not um, it's it's not particularly complex, and um, it has a lot of concurrent constructs, uh, which are very important to the to the handling of network aspects. So, the way I'm going to do that is I have Visual Studio Code installed in my um, in my system, and I've installed Ballerina. And the only other thing I have installed is I have Docker and Kubernetes running, which I'm going to use for some of the demos. And I have a couple of things on the cloud that I hope to get to as well. So I'm going to start up a new uh, ballerina file, .bal, and Visual Studio Code has got the, uh, has already imported the, the plugin for that. So let's uh, start by writing hello world. Now, being a network programming language, our hello world is going to be our HTTP server that returns hello world to a, to a client. So I'm going to start by importing the HTTP package and I'm going to define a service. And in Ballerina, services are first class constructs. So in, in most languages, there's just one entry point, which is main. And then if you want to build a network server, you have to use some library or package that, that knows that you start up in main and then you go and start some listener and then and a thread pull and everything else. In Ballerina, the concept of a, of a listener, a service is, is built in and, and those can be HTTP listeners, gRPC, Kafka. They can react to messages, AMQP, all sorts of different protocols. Um, so this is the, really the simplest possible uh, Ballerina network program so i'm just going to say hello cncf and um and i'm i said this is a compiled language so i'm gonna go and and compile it so there's a ballerina command and i'm going to build that demo.bal and that's going to create a, a balex and i'm going to just run that. So Ballerina has a uh, bytecode and uh, a bytecode virtual machine. So I'm going to use that to run this bytecode. And now it's listening on port 9090. I'll explain that code in a second in a bit more detail, but I just thought it would be useful just to show you uh, actually a service running. And We've got two, we've got a service and a resource within that service. And so the, by default, the, the path is, is created from those. We'll show you how to do that. So there we go. In, in about a minute, I've created my first network service. Now, I said services are first class citizens. In fact, also so are endpoints. So an endpoint is a, is a, is a network listener or a network sender so it's either a server or a client and so what we've really done here is to bind this service to a particular network listener and i did that in a in a, just an inline way but actually it's nicer to show you that network endpoints are first class citizens um the other thing i wanted to show is that what i'm really doing here is is creating a new is creating a http response which is an object and I can new it up, up and I can set the payload on that. And you can see there's a whole load of different HTTP-ish things you can do. And I can set a payload on there and I'm gonna just cut that and put it in there instead. Now, 
uh, and I need to respond with that uh, response. So this is interesting that here you see I have an object and I have a method on that object which is a local method and I'm going res dot set payload and that's because it's a local method and here I have another endpoint which is the my reference to the caller and I'm responding with an arrow this arrow indicates there's a network call happening here so the syntax instantly is showing us that we have a network interaction going on here and I think this is really interesting because one of the you know, famous things is that the fallacy of distributed computing is it's the same as local. Within this language, you can clearly see when you're making remote calls because they, they appear in the syntax. And this also has some semantic meaning as well. So it's not just about the syntax. The semantic meaning I'm going to come back to in a little bit. And then this underscore equal. So every function that returns a value, you have to deal with the return. Uh, even if you just say, I don't want to deal with it. So in this case, this is the server responding back to the caller. If there's an error at that point, then there's not much we can do apart from log it because we've already lost the connection to the, to the, from the client. So in this case, I am going to just drop it. So there we go. Now that's basically the same code that I showed you before. I've just been a bit clearer about what's going on. But I, I probably want to not just have this hello, hi path that, that was running. So what I can do is I can annotate this service uh, with a config and I can set a base path um, of slash and I can annotate the resource and say I want the path there to be slash and I can also uh, be more explicit I could say that I only want to support a post so there is a uh, saying that the methods that are acceptable are post and I can actually specify that this resource has a, 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 a parameter we're going to pass and I'm going to say it's a string and this is the body of the message coming in so I can actually grab that string and now do that now you can bind JSON, XML, different data types, and, and there's also mapping from JSON into, into the record and object types of Ballerina. But uh, that's probably a bit complex to go into right now. But this is kind of nice. I want to just say, I'm gonna pass over a text message uh, in, the, in the body of the post, and I'm gonna use that to respond. Um, and so that's that's great. And what have I done here? I've put my plus and quotes in the wrong place. Now, I'm going to just explain this to you. What's interesting, another thing about network uh, programming is we all know that there are challenges with, for instance, SQL injection attacks. So people can pass over tainted data over a network connection especially in an HTTP post or a gRPC body. And so what Ballerina does is it just implicitly assumes that all data coming from the, the wire is tainted. And so it, it's got taint checking built into the language, which is, which is pretty unique. Uh, there's a couple of languages that have considered this, but uh, we, think, we think this is pretty much the only language that has built it right into the language from day one. Now, I'm just doing a demo, so I'm going to explicitly untaint that and say, well, I'm just responding back to you. Uh, if you want to see your tainted data, you can have that. So in this case, we can just untaint it. But normally you might do something like, you might say string clean body equals untaint and then body dot replace. And then you can use a regex to clean out any, any problems. So you can see how that would work. So we've now got a parameter being passed. We've got a post required. We've changed the path. So done some useful things. I'm going to rebuild that. Hopefully I haven't got any syntax errors. And I'm going to run that. And now uh, I don't need that path, but I do need to specify this is a post. Um, post, And I do need to pass over a body 
which is, I'm going to say, hello, Caitlin. And I hope I can spell your name, Caitlin, correctly. Ah, what have I done there? Ah, I know what I've done. I have failed to tell me that the body is going to be this parameter. So I need to bind the body of the message to this parameter here. So I I'm always make mistakes in live demos. You can see what I'm doing there. So let me try again and run it. And now hopefully, there we go. So very quickly, you can see we've done some, some simple network programming, but I want to do more. I want to now call another network service. Now there's two ways I could do that. I can, for instance, just create an HTTP client and, and do HTTP gets. That would be very natural and that would be easy. But I can also um, go and use some connectors. And so I'm going to uh, go and search and see if there's a Twitter connector. Now, Ballerina has a package manager built in and it has this concept of connectors. Connectors are explicitly network systems. And we can see there's a connector there called wso 2 slash Twitter. So I'm going to pull that. And it's going to download it. And there's a slight problem in my terminal in there. But anyway, there we go. And so now I'm going to uh, import wso 2 slash Twitter. And I'm going to create a new endpoint, which is a, the, the Twitter endpoint that I'm going to call. So this is going to be a Twitter client, and I'm going to call it Twitter. And I need to configure a whole bunch of secrets and stuff to talk to that. So you can't talk to Twitter without having uh, some OAuth2 secrets and so forth. So uh, Rather than waste your time typing them, I'm going to just, I have a snippet of uh, code here, and I'm going to go and copy and paste that uh, in here. And that is going to, I'm, I'm not going to paste my secrets in here right now because you're all watching and, and this is being recorded. I don't want you to see my, my Twitter OAuth keys. So I've got them in a config file and I'm going to import a ballerina config, which knows how to read that. Uh, and it could, it would also read it from a, an environment variable if necessary. So now I've got this tweeter object. I can say I've got a new string, which is the status uh, to tweet. And I'm going to just grab that untaint the body and say hello and uh, add a hashtag because why not ballerina lang okay and now what i want to do is i want to use that tweeter and it, once again we have an arrow to say we're actually doing a network uh, message and i'm gonna tweet that and i'm gonna get some kind of response back now Although it's a strongly typed language, it does have type inference. So I could just say var uh, response equals tweeter arrow tweet. And the, the type system in Ballerina is also keyed around network constructs. So the type system is a union type system. It's very similar to Elm or Haskell and some of those. But uh, in this, so what that means is that I can basically say uh, the response is either a status or a Twitter error. And I can handle each of those in turn. Now, that's fine, but for a quick demo, I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to say basically, I don't, I'm going to, I know this is going to Twitter status coming back. Now, it's saying that it, has, it, it might be an error. There's a way of dealing with that, which is basically just to say, check, check, check if it's an error. If it's an error, then this is going to give me a response, basically gonna tell the, the HTTP server there's an error, 
and the HTTP server is going to send back an internal server error to the client. So it's going to automatically handle that error for me. Um, now I said before we have JSON, so we can just create a JSON directly, and you can just go kind of you know, key value like like any JSON in line here. Um, but and I can say that the uh, you know created is that uh, and that's response dot uh, created at. So that's coming back from uh, Twitter. So let's give me the created at, and I can say the ID is response dot ID. And so now I've got a JSON I've created from that Twitter stuff, and I can simply send that JSON back to the client and say yes. So this is kind of nice. So what we're doing is we're getting some a name in, in the body of the message. We're untainting it, adding uh, ballerina lang to it, tweeting that status, and then getting the response back and responding back to the client with that new JSON that we've created. So let's just build that. Now this time when I run it, I do need to pass over some config. So I need to pass over my Twitter and it's stored in, in Toml, which is a bit like YAML, but slightly nicer. So there we go. And now I'm gonna say, CNC F and see what happens. Excellent. Well, it's come back with a created date and a Twitter ID. So I'm pretty confident that this has worked. Um, but let's just go and look at my uh, Twitter feed, see one new tweet, and there it is. So in a pretty short space of time, We've done quite a lot of things. Let me go back to my presentation and we've done hello world. So the caller did a get request and we got hello world back. Uh, then we did some annotations, which allowed me to do a post of a name and, and return with hello name. Then we used a Twitter connector and we did a post of a status and we tweeted that, we got the response back and responded back to the client. But in fact, we're really doing some, some data transformation. I was uh, actually taking that that uh, body of the message as a text, untainting it, adding a, a hashtag, and then turning that response from Twitter into a different JSON to send back to the caller. So quite a lot of nice things. Now, I said before that that arrow had some different semantics. One of the really nice things here is that the semantics of this network send is it's inherently async IO. What does that mean? That means that when I do that, let me go back to my Twitter thing. When I go and do this Twitter arrow tweet, that might take some time. Now, if I did that in a normal, in, in Java say, by default, that would block a thread while it's waiting for the Twitter to respond. Uh, in Node.js, I would use a callback. So I'd basically say, I want you to go away and do this and call me back when I'm done. And then I would have to embed all this ongoing logic into my callback. In Ballerina, it does both of those things for you. So this logic happens after this thread. So this, this thread is not blocked. There's a worker which is dissociated from the thread. Uh, and this syntax that comes after the, the Twitter tweet is basically a continuation. So it happens on a different thread, but you don't have to worry about that. So what that means is when you write this kind of code with Ballerina, it's not thread bound, it uses async IO, it's automatically very, very high performance. So these are kind of nice things um, that, that other languages do not do automatically. One of the things that inspired us is that whenever we kind of build these systems, uh, 
for for our customers or for ourselves, we always end up drawing sequence diagrams. The, the, the bit of UML that I think is most useful to capture these kind of interactions. And the language of ballerina is, is uh, isomorphic to a sequence diagram. And this is where this arrow syntax came from, because that's like an arrow in a sequence diagram. And if I go look at this little icon in the corner, it says ballerina show diagram. I click on that, it's going to show me that sequence diagram. Let me just enlarge that for you so you can see. Uh, this is the sequence diagram generated from that code. So I have the caller sending over the body. I do a bit of logic. It, it tweets that to my Twitter endpoint. I get the response back. I do a bit more transformation. I create a JSON and I send that JSON back to the caller. This is, this is really nice. Um, you actually can go and edit that logic. Uh, I'm not such a big fan of that. I, I like typing code. Uh, but uh, there are certainly people who want to do that. Let me just show you if I um, and a bit more logic so I can say if not status to tweet uh, contains uh, uh, at ballerina lang then I want to add it. So I want to go to status to tweet plus equals this at ballerina lang. And you can see as I did that, it's updated the sequence diagram with that if uh, aspect. So that's really nice. Um, so we have a language that, that has a sort of inherently network oriented approach. It's based on sequence diagrams. It does asynchronous IO. It has services and endpoints as first class citizens. Uh, it's, it's really a, a, a language that's designed to build cloud native applications. But let's go a step further and actually show that in practice and deploy this code into Kubernetes and show you that it is really a cloud native language in, in more senses than that. So we have built in support for Docker and Kubernetes and uh, they're under a package called Valerina X because they're really a kind of an extension. Um, so I'm going to annotate this now with some Kubernetes things. So if I go to, uh, so that endpoint listener that where we're listening is what Kubernetes calls a service. So I'm going to annotate that with a, um, a name and I'm gonna call it uh, Ballerina Demo. And I'm gonna annotate it with a service type and it's gonna be a node port. And then I also need to annotate the actual piece of logic. Uh, and I'm gonna to go to my demo snippets and cheat and find a, a little bit of code here and cut and paste that. And I'll explain this. So firstly, this is gonna create a Kubernetes deployment. So I'm gonna give that an image name because this is gonna create a container that's gonna be deployed in Kubernetes. And also I need to pass over that TOML config file and the way I'm gonna do that is using what Kubernetes calls a config map. So if I now go and kill this uh, window, and I clear that, and now I'm gonna build that again. And what it's done, let me just enlarge that window, it's actually, sorry, the, the, the screens doesn't show very well in VS Code, but basically it's actually building the Docker container the docker file and it's building all the yaml for kubernetes so it's doing all of that for me just from those simple annotations and it now says uh, if you want to deploy this you've got two choices because it's actually not just built the kubernetes yaml it's also built a helm chart for your app so you can either do a kubectl apply uh, to to add this or you can do a helm install so let me just show you, let me enlarge this command window a little bit more so you can see what's going on. And um, I'm gonna do kubectl get all. Now I said I've got uh, Kubernetes running here. It's running as part of Docker. Uh, it's really nice. Uh, so makes it really super easy. So I've got nothing running. I'm gonna do a kubectl apply 
minus f and it's all in the Kubernetes directory. Now let me just tree that so you can see it has created um, Helm charts and it's created the config map deployment and service YAMLs for Kubernetes and it's created the Docker file. So it's done all of that for me. And now I can do a kubectl get all again. And you can see it's now running on port 31849. So if I go back over here and I curl, now I have to be careful because Twitter won't let me tweet the same tweet twice in a short space of time. So I'm going to say hi CNCF uh, fans and change this port to whatever that was. Let me do it one more time uh, 31849. And I'm going to just say hello, fans. Um, I need these. And tweet it again. So let's go look at my Twitter feed and see how we're doing. I'll reload that. And there we go. So I've now deployed that code in, in Kubernetes. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so we've done some Twitter stuff. I've done it in Kubernetes. Uh, I'm going to stop showing you demo stuff now because I think that's probably enough for the webinar. I'm just going to talk through a few other things that you can do. Um, so uh, one of the, the patterns that's very common in building distributed systems is something called a circuit breaker. So uh, for instance, suppose I want to, instead of me writing the status, I want to go and grab a, a quote from Homer Simpson. And then I want to tweet that quote. Now, suppose that Homer Simpson quote service goes down. What typically happens in a distributed system is that uh, the, these servers that are, that are trying to call the, another server, they retry, they expect failure and they retry. So you, you expect that remote services might go down and, and when they do, you treat, retry them. The problem with that, is that if that Homer Simpson quote service goes down and now uh, I have a whole cluster of servers trying it, they're all retrying it. The minute it comes back up, it's going to be hammered and it's going to go down again instantly. So the circuit breaker pattern basically says that if that service goes down, I'm going to give it time to recover before sending requests to it again. And that's a circuit breaker. Let me just quickly show you what that looks like. So if I do dot oh, uh, and this is very similar code to what we've just seen. It's got the same tweeter, it's got the same listener. Here's my Homer Simpson quote service. And I have a, a circuit breaker that basically says, uh, I have a rolling window of 10 seconds and every second I'm gonna have a bucket and if I get any failures at all, I'm going to give it three seconds to back off before coming back. And I'm going to treat a one second delay as being that the service is down. So in this model, it's really, really easy. And I can show you the, the sequence diagram for that. Um, I'm basically going to try and get that quote because it's got the circuit breaker. Uh, it's going to automatically use the error handling to, to tweet a, a standard tweet if it's down, carry on, and then payload. So this kind of stuff, now you can do this with Ballerina with a service mesh. So that will be another way of doing this. And there's some great guides on how to use Ballerina with, with Istio, Envoy, Linkerd up on the Ballerina website. But if you just want a circuit breaker, you don't necessarily want to install a whole service mesh to do that. And so, so circuit breakers are built in. Um, another thing that's really important in a cloud native environment is observability. So uh, out of the box, uh, Ballerina supports open tracing. So you just have to configure it uh, to point at your Jaeger or Zipkin install, and it will generate these kind of charts. There's no coding required to do that. Uh, again, out of the box, it, it has Prometheus and Grafana support. So 
It will produce metrics on um, how many requests there are, how many errors, uh, how many things are in progress. All of that kind of uh, metrics will come straight out of the box. And it also works with other observability services like Honeycomb and Humio. And there's some very good webinars uh, out there about that. And, you know, it works with ELK. Admittedly, that's just a question of getting the logs in the right place, but there's some nice documentation on how to how to work with ELK. So, you know, is it agile? Uh, I think, you know, I've been through uh, three or four code build test cycles while we've been speaking on this on this webinar. So uh, I think you can see it fits well into an agile uh, programming model. But the, the fact that it's got all those network concepts built into the language also makes it really, really effective for, for integration and distributed computing. Uh, I'm just going to show you some continuous stuff. So if I go over here, I have a CodeFresh console. CodeFresh is like Travis. It's an automated build system in, on the web. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and uh, I have a... A, a repository here on my machine with a ballerina, a bit of ballerina code in it, and I'm going to just edit uh, just edit the the test uh, hello service. So this is a kind of hello world, just like you've seen. Um, it has a Docker config in it this time, and it says hello world, and that's the current thing. I'm going to go hello CNCF. And I'm going to save that. And now I'll just go back to my terminal and I'm going to do a, let's see if I've got it up in my history. There we are. I'm going to uh, git add and put a comment here. So I'm checking that into git. Uh, CodeFresh is linked to my GitHub account. Uh, so that is going to automatically fire off a build. So if I go back to CodeFresh, we can go and see uh, that there's a build now running, or well, it's pending. So I'll show you that in a second. Let me just show you what's happening. So I have a Kubernetes cluster running in Google Cloud Platform, and that's got a service which has got my, um, let me go look at the services, has got my that ballerina code running, and if I go click on it, it says hello world, because that's the old version. Uh, CodeFresh is going to go through a little build process that's going to clone that repository, build the service, test uh, test it, build the image, push the image, and deploy it all to Kubernetes cluster. And this is all configured. Let me just quickly show you. Um, this is all configured off a of CodeFresh YAML, which has those steps in it. So if I go in and kill, and kill that ballerina window, so you can see those steps that I just showed you in the CodeFresh window are the package it, which so basically does ballerina build, be test, uh, run the test, so ballerina test, uh, create the image, push the image, and deploy to, to the cluster. So let's go and see how that's uh, doing pretty well. We've cloned it, we've run the tests, they're all working, let me show you. So the tests have run. Ballerina has its own built-in unit test system, um, which, is, which is really nice. And this is not doing a local test. This is doing a genuine network test. So this is doing starting up the server and doing an HTTP call to it. So it's a proper network unit test. It's just building that Docker image. Uh, it's built it. It's pushing it out to, um, to, the, do to the Google Cloud uh, Docker Hub. And it's going to go now deploy it to the Google DK cluster. Let's see how that does. And it now says it's done. So if I go back to that service and reload it. And okay, hold on. Maybe it's not done. Oh no, it's not done. Uh, good old live demos. So I'm just waiting. No, okay, now it's done. Uh, let's go and see. Successfully ran freestyle step, deployed to Google Cluster, and 
some reason it's not updated it. I do not know why it's not done that. It's the curse of a live demo. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, sorry about that, guys. So as you can see, it fits nicely into a continuous thing. Uh, it has built-in support for gRPC and protobuf. So you just write ballerina code and it generates the protobuf for you. So it makes it super easy to write those kind of network services. It has built-in support for Swagger. If you know what that is, that's a HTTP RESTful description language. You can just say, give me a Swagger for this ballerina program. And it does that. You don't have to do any annotations. Uh, you can if you want. Uh, it has a full async model as well. So I said that it's doing the async under the covers. If you want to do uh, your own async, then you can basically, there's futures and starts. There's a very powerful concurrency model based on workers and, and messages across channels. Um, so, you know, we have built-in package management. We have type checking during compilation. We have a, a union type system that mirrors network messages clearly and supports things like XML and JSON. Uh, as you can see, a very nice editing facility in, in VS Code and also in IntelliJ. Uh, Built-in unit testing integrations with Testarina. And uh, I hope you like it. Uh, that's basically my demo. Everything I demoed is in, in a set of guides on Ballerina IO called Ballerina by Guide. Those are the versions I used. And so to summarize, um, you know, we have a language here that's really designed to help you write the glue logic between microservices, APIs, SaaS apps, and, and different types of network endpoint. It, it is a general purpose language, but it's really focused on this uh, ability to write these simple pieces of glue logic between different network endpoints. Uh, to visualize them as sequence diagrams and, and to be highly productive and agile in that in that space and uh, I talked about a whole set of capabilities CICD union types I didn't go into the worker model and concurrency model but it's very simple and very powerful I didn't talk about things like lambdas uh, versioning which is built in uh, all sorts of other capabilities that, that it has. Um, it has, for instance, some capabilities to do long running workflows and do checkpointing. There's uh, the ability to do stream processing. There's all sorts of nice stuff in there. So I really encourage you to find out more. Any of you who happen to be in the UK, and I know that's, uh, we're a global audience today, so I'm, I'm being a bit parochial, but I'm based in the UK and I'm gonna be talking at a ballerina day in London on november 15th um so please sign up that's a free registration and um most of all i'd really love to see you know people here get involved you know so it's an open source project pull requests are most welcome it's under the apache license uh, there's a great website ballerina io um we were very active on stack overflow there's a slack channel where we're also very active so please get involved you know there's multiple ways of contributing you can uh, help us improve the syntax and, and the semantics of the language that's still uh, being tweaked we're not quite 1.0 yet uh, you can uh, write new connectors for different endpoints you can help integrate it into different runtimes we, we'd love to add a pivotal cloud foundry uh, plug in alongside the docker and kubernetes so there's a whole bunch of of things that, that we'd love contribution on. Or you can just tell us what you think and, and, and get involved that way. And I, I, I wanna, I, 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 one of the kind of questions people might ask is, you know, what stage is this language at? So we're not completely language locked on the syntax. So we are still doing the syntax, but it's pretty robust. We do automated performance tests with every release. We do long running tests and, and there are people using this in production already. So it, it's a funny sort of situation where, where it's stable to write code in, but at some point you might have to port that code over to 1.0 when we, when we finally lock the language in. So I hope that's been useful. And I really wanna thank everyone for taking the time. And I hope we've got a bit of time for Q and A. I, I 
spent slightly more time than I wanted, but I think we've still got 10 minutes for Q&A, so that should be good. Awesome. Thanks, Paul, for the great presentation. And we do have a few minutes now uh, for questions. So just a reminder, if you have questions that you'd like to ask, please drop them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many as we have time for. Brilliant. All right. So our first question is, what are the advantages of using Ballerina over a cloud integration SaaS like MuleSoft? That's, that's a really interesting question. So the, I, I think the, the cloud integration toolkits like MuleSoft and, and Dell Boomi, uh, SnapLogic, are, are really, really good if you are a, uh, what they call a citizen integrator. So a citizen integrator is someone who, who's trying to integrate their own stuff. You're a business guy. You, you understand the business and you want a simple drag and drop approach. And as you know, and, I, and I have no problem with that. I think, I think that's really useful. But I think if you're a developer trying to do that integration, that those kind of drag and drop environments and those uh, which are fundamentally managed by, by a DSL in the background, um, a, a domain specific language are, are really painful. You know, I think developers like real programming languages. And for example, you know, when you come to do one of those things like a string manipulation in, in one of those toolkits, you, you end up actually, the language doesn't just support general purpose stuff. You end up saying, okay, now I'm gonna drop into JavaScript uh, or I'm gonna drop into a different model. Sometimes, sometimes you need X path, sometimes you need JSON path. So you have all these kind of constructs that help you do everyday things. But as soon as you do that, you're now in, in two different worlds. You're in the DSL that's, that's doing the overall flow and then you're in JavaScript to handle the, your bit of logic. And, and Ballerina doesn't have that divide. You're just in, in a language. It's a, it's a full programming language you get a graphical view, but as a programmer, you can write code, but you don't have to spend so much of your time worrying about connectors, network handling, circuit breakers, JSON transformation, and so forth, because the code understands those things inherently. Great. Um, so someone else is asking how this compares to Go. That's a, that's a really interesting question. I, I think, I think, you know, Go is, is not designed with this sort of tighter focus. So I think this, this language has been designed to help you do these kind of network integration tasks. Go is a very general purpose language with, with a, you know, that's designed to build highly concurrent system services. And you can build highly concurrent system services with this and you can build really good network programs with Go. So, you know, all, most languages are sort of, you know, there's a, there's a concept of Turing completeness. You can do pretty much anything with any language. I, I think Go doesn't inherently address these network challenges. So in Go, you, you solve these, these network problems by using the concurrency model to say, now I want to go and uh, hand over my network piece of code to another Go routine. In Ballerina, that's implicit. Every time you call a network service with that arrow, you're implicitly dealing with it asynchronously with another work, with a, with a separate piece of worker logic uh, that's, that's under the covers. I'm, I'm, what I just said there is not actually strictly accurate, but it's, that's the intent of it. That, that it's handling it for you, the async IO, without you having to worry about it. And I, I think the other thing that, that, that uh, Ballerina has, it has a, I, I, I have to say, I think the type system is, is slightly more beautiful than Go's type system, uh, but that's, you know, your mileage may vary every, that's I think a personal thing. Uh, but I do think that it's a, a slightly simpler language to learn. Um, 
I, I, I think it's, I, I found it easier to learn ballerina than to, to learn go. So, you know, and again, that's personal, but I, I think it has a sweet spot when it comes to building these network services that is more optimized for that than go is. And, and I know go is more optimized for some other things. Um, and if I, if I wanted to be slightly snarky and I'm, I'm only joking here, so please don't take offense. Um, uh, I think the other thing I, I'd say is that we built our package management in from day one. So there's been no arguments about how to do package management in Ballerina. But... All right. Um, is Ballerina serverless functions compatible? And if yes, which platforms? That's a great question. Yes, it is. And um, there's already support for uh, Ballerina functions in Kubeless and in OpenWhisk. Um, and I know that, that the Ballerina team and, and some other teams are working on getting serverless support into other frameworks as well. But those are the two I know about already that already are shipping Ballerina support. So that's Kubeless and OpenWhisk. Awesome. Are there any types of cloud workloads that you would personally not recommend using Ballerina for? So certainly, I mean, I mean, lots of cloud workloads have, you know, very complex uh, logic that is that is not just talking to, to other network services. Now, you know, we have a, an object model. So so Ballerina has the concept of objects. It's not it's not a it's it's a simpler model and say Java or, or, or C sharp, it doesn't have all the inheritance and stuff. But you know, if you wanted to model out a, a highly complex set of uh, business domain logic, uh, I wouldn't use Ballerina. I think that that's not its purpose. Uh, now, other people might, might say, you know, you can do that and you certainly can, but that's not where I see the sweet spot for Ballerina. I see the sweet spot in in writing this this logic that that orchestrates and and composes between other services that that have the heavy lifting on the business logic now that doesn't mean you know i think there are simpler ways of writing business logic but I, you know, I wouldn't write a core banking application in ballerina today um but i certainly if i had a core banking application and i wanted to build a new capability say like a psd2 compliant front end on it then Ballerina would be a great choice. All right, looks like we are at the end of our questions for today. If anyone else has any, feel free to drop them in now. Otherwise, um, I think we'll wrap up here. So. Awesome. Thank you very much, Caitlin, and thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and just a reminder, the webinar recording and slides will be online later today. Um, you'll receive an email with those links. And we'll, we look forward to seeing everyone at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day.